Hello, my name is Tony. Personal perception is a curious thing, connected definitively to personal taste and preference. I have yet to find anyone who rates the Macintosh man as anything but mediocre or unedifying or uninspiring. Yet it was and is one of my personal favourite 70s spy thrillers in which I continue to find many elements to recommend it. However, when I've extolled its virtues in the past, I've always been shot down. I've been told that with the individual talents involved in the production, how much better it should have been and what a disappointing failure it is, a prime example of seriously unrealised potential. Yet, where I'm concerned, there's very little I would want to change about it. So, bloody-mindedly, I'm going to give it something of a reappraisal. And you never know, there might be someone out there who gets the same positive, tingly vibe from it that I do. Not that I'm particularly worried that there isn't, you can please yourselves, but I maintain that whilst it is not a great movie, it's nowhere near the lame duck it's been painted. The Macintosh man has been unfairly maligned by God, and I shall endeavour ever to explain why. At the time, it must have seemed like a dream ticket. First off, you have John Huston directing the legendary John Huston, the man who directed such Hollywood classics as The Treasure of the Sierra Madre, The Maltese Falcon, The Asphalt Jungle, Key Largo, and The African Queen. Okay, so his career went off a bit in the 60s, but still, I mean, John Huston, man. Then the screenplay is by Walter Hill, the legendary Walter Hill, the man who scripted Peckinpah's The Getaway and went on to write and direct such standards Standouts as Driver, The Warriors, The Long Riders, Sudden Comfort, and 48 Hours. The film was based on The Freedom Trap, a best selling novel by acclaimed British author Desmond Bagley, who was almost as popular for a time as Alistair MacLean. The score was by Maurice Jarre, who composed the soundtracks for Dr. Zhivago, Is Paris Burning, and Ryan's Daughter. The star was Paul Newman, for fuck's sake, one of the biggest box office draws on the planet. James Mason, Harry Andrews, Ian Bannon, Dominique. Sander, Michael Horden and Jenny Runacre were in the supporting cast. Cinematography was by Oswald Morris. He lends movies such as The Spy Who Came In From The Cold, Oliver and Fiddler On The Roof. Now there's a title you'll be hard pressed to get away with today. You've got a dream team right here folks. Yet despite this, the film did shit all business at the box office, was brutally dismissed by critics and is barely remembered nowadays. When I saw it in the market hall cinema, there were only two other people in there. One was asleep and might have been either mentally ill or drunk, or, now I think about it, both. The other was awake and just mentally ill. He laughed hysterically when the dog got killed and burst into tears when the bad guy's car went off a cliff. You want my theory? Don't know why I'm asking, because I'm giving it to you anyway. It was too good for the public and the arty-farty Philip Jenkinson-type snobberazzi movie reviewers of the time. Too understated, too nuanced, too subtle, and too low-key. It wasn't jaw-droppingly spectacular or action-packed, nor was it painstakingly artistic or brain-freezingly cerebral. And thus it succeeded in pleasing no one. No one, that is, except for me. And in the scheme of things, I will try and elucidate. But first, some story. Joseph Riordan, played by Paul Newman, is a British intelligence operative who is engaged by covert operations chief Macintosh, Harry Andrews, and his assistant, Mrs. Smith, Dominique Sander, to take on the undercover role of an Australian thief. Reardon is given the job of robbing a courier of some diamonds. I say courier, he's just a common old garden postman pat type. Reardon achieves this by belting the living shit out of the poor sap. The fuzz move in unfeasibly quickly and Reardon is apprehended that evening at his hotel. The diamonds cannot be located and Reardon refuses to reveal their whereabouts. This doesn't gain him much favour with the judge at his trial and taking into account the damage he inflicted on the postie and probably his black and white cat and his seeming lack of remorse lands him a 20 stretch and off to prison he goes. One of his fellow inmates is Slade Ian Bannon, a former traitorous British spook exposed and sentenced as a KGB mole and treated as a high security prisoner. Riordan is approached by another fellow inmate who is a middleman for an organisation known as the Scarperers which can offer him a chance of escape and a new identity abroad for a 50% cut of his diamond haul. On the daring but perfectly orchestrated prison break, Riordan is accompanied by Slade, who is also being sprung from the chokey. They are both drugged and find themselves in an isolated manor house in barren, rugged countryside in the middle of nowhere. They are guarded by Gerda, Jenny Runacre and some heavies and advised that they will be kept in the manor for a week and then moved on. The lord of the manor, Brown, played by Michael Horden, is the leader of the Scarperers. Meanwhile, in the House of Commons, patriotic right-wing MP Sir George Wheeler, James Mason, 
he is complaining about the handling of the Slade escape by the authorities. He is approached by McIntosh, an old army comrade, and advised of a sting operation in play to identify and round up the gang and all its associates, and either return Slade to prison or punch his ticket. Riordan is the key player and undercover operative in this subterfuge. The diamond theft and his subsequent prosecution was all a fabrication. Wheeler, however, is in fact a communist KGB double agent, which McIntosh suspects, and almost immediately contacts and alerts Brown, confirming McIntosh's suspicions. Only trouble is, McIntosh becomes the victim of a hit-and-run incident arranged by Wheeler, and is hospitalised in a coma. The prison breakers now know that Riordan is a Trojan horse, and the only person who can officially clear or help him is McIntosh. And of course, McIntosh isn't talking. Riordan is beaten up, tortured, and only kept alive for information. His days are clearly numbered. He manages to escape from the manor house, burning it down and drowning a dog in the process. He absconds across the bleak countryside. Reaching a nearby harbour town, he discovers he is on the west coast of Ireland and moored offshore is Wheeler's private yacht. The yacht is en route to Malta, and Riordan concludes that Slade must be on board, being smuggled out of the country. With Macintosh nil by mouth, it falls to Riordan and Mrs. Smith, who reveals herself to be Macintosh's daughter, to pursue Wheeler and Slade to Malta and bring them to justice. Oh, and get Riordan off the hook. Will they succeed? Watch it and find out. That's enough of the narrative stuff from me. What we have here is a small-scale neo-noir spy thriller with no elaborate frills. It has no aspirations to be a blockbuster action movie or a sword in romance, a weighty epic, or deep socio-political treaties. It is a straightforward, grassroots little thriller, a downbeat spy flick with minimal gloss or glamour, more Le Carre or Dayton than Fleming. It has faint echoes of the third man and funeral in Berlin. The characters are flawed human beings, not superheroes or misshapen pantomime villains striving for world domination. In some respects, it's a bit ordinary, a down-to-earth depiction of the grubby and dangerous world of spies, spy masters, and duplicitous traders or pursuing their own individual agendas and ideologies. The performances. Now, Paul Newman was one of the best-looking male actors Hollywood ever produced. I mean, I'm a straight guy, but I'm not so hung up on that or sexually insecure. I can't see and openly admit Newman is one handsome slab of prime all-American beefcake. Face, physique, hair, eyes, teeth, personality, the works. Man was an Adonis on earth and apparently a beer aficionado. He once said there are 24 bottles in a crate of beer and 24 hours in a day. Coincidence? I think not. Man used to drink beer by the crate. He became a rich, handsome Hollywood megastar. Following his example, I drank beer by the crate and became a fat, dysfunctional, drunken bum. To this day, I still wonder what exactly went wrong. Despite being a major Hollywood star, Newman's forte does not appear to extend to accents. He is supposed to be a British operative, but his accent remains resolutely American. On the following evidence, sending him undercover as an Australian was probably a mistake. How's your accent? It's all right. Clear dinkum, cover. What was that? Yeah, what the fuck was that? That's an Australian accent mimicked by someone who never heard an Australian accent before, but based their version on one they had described to them in a letter composed in Braille. Once in prison, and for the rest of the film up until the action switches to Malta, Newman's accent tunes in and out. It's not a good look. Doesn't help with characterization, but with a little effort I found I could move beyond it. Put it to the back of my mind. Cobber. Despite the ambiguous accent issues, Newman remains a charismatic lead, looking fit and agile in the sporadic and realistic action sequences, cynical and ruthless in his ongoing fight to survive and see the mission through. Not his best work, but not bad. Serviceable more than inspired. James Mason had a certain talent for tapping a resource of silky villainy in many of his screen roles. His performance here is no different, effectively conveying the essence of a man who on the surface is all upper-class bonhomie and generosity of spirit, a staunch patriot and champion of justice, whilst underneath he is a scheming, duplicitous traitor to queen and country. There is also solid support from Michael Horden as a sociopathic aristocrat. He sets his guard dog on Riordan and responds with the misplaced effrontery and rage of a fanatical animal lover when Riordan dares to retaliate by kicking the mutt. Harry Andrews is nicely cast as the doomed spy chief Macintosh, and Ian Bannon is pretty good as treacherous Slade. Also, it's a rare treat to see the underused Jenny Runacre as sadistic henchperson Gerda. I use the term henchperson because her gender is thrown into question despite looking positively female, and when Riordan suggests they have sex, she asks him if there's anything he wants, and he replies, a poke? She responds with... <laughs> I'm afraid I stopped being a woman several years ago. She's a fun little bad guy. Sorry, person. 
bad person. Minor fly in the ointment is female lead Dominique Sander. She looks great, sleek model figure and chiselled cheekbones, blue eyes and silver crimped blonde hair, but she's a bit lacking as an actress. I'm assuming that being French, English is not her first language, and she was cast more for her appearance and screen presence than any thespian talent. However, she's certainly appealing enough visually, and she did a reasonable job of conveying a murderously ruthless and vengeful streak at the end of the picture. There are some great moments to focus on. The prison break is a well-choreographed set piece, as is Riordan's escape from the manor house, setting the place on fire, violently assaulting his captors, and legging it across the barren landscape reminds of Hitchcock's The 39 Steps, although this is a more aggressive flight from pursuit. As Riordan flees and the manor house burns behind him, the film takes on an acutely suspense for almost dreamlike quality, backed by some eerie musical stylings from Morris Shah. An excellent sequence. A car chase in which Brown's heavy speed after Riordan and Mrs. Smith in their beaten up old truck on precarious Irish country roads and across precipitous cliff tops is a cool little diversion and airs on the side of realism rather than unfeasible motorised stunt work. Love Riordan's laconic quip after the bad guys lose control and plunge to their doom. You think they can swim, Mr. Riordan? I hardly think that matters, Mrs. Smith. Once in Malta, the film adopts a different visual tone and sees Mrs. Smith, Mickey Finned and kidnapped by Wheeler. Riordan is up against time and the odds to get her back safely and take down Wheeler and Slade. Even though the backdrop to events is brighter and more glamorous, the climactic night scenes retain a pleasingly noirish quality. Long shadows, back streets, empty church. Positive mention has to go to Oswald Morris's cinematography. Muted gunmetal greys, browns and greens in the UK set part of the story count appointed with crisper, more vibrant and popping hues for the Maltese locations. I wonder if that choice of locale was Houston's nod to a certain falcon. Additionally, Maurice Jarre's score is a memorable piece of work, the central theme adapting cues from the third man and incorporating them into an addictive sonic motif that sticks in your head and won't let go. Some of the dialogue clunks like a bell clapper dropped into a copper bottom commode, but if you want Shakespeare, then go see Shakespeare. Like I said, it's not a great film, but I feel it is a good one that was all too casually dispensed with. I watched it at the same time as a comatose drunk and a paranoid schizophrenic, so didn't really feel any compelling and urge to ask for their critical appraisal afterwards. The critics and public of the time spoke, however, and pretty unfavourably. In some ways, I get their point. Committed Bond fans and action junkies wouldn't get their fix here. Anyone on the lookout for a deeper, meaningful exploration into anything? Likewise. So who is the intended audience, apart from obtuse dicks like me? If you like Carol Reed's The Third Man, Martin Ritz, The Spy Who Came In From The Cold, Guy Hamilton's Funeral In Berlin, or Michael Anderson's The Quiller Memorandum, this is the the sort of essence and atmosphere the Macintosh man attempts to channel, and it does succeed to a degree. If you've never seen it and this sort of stuff appeals to you, give it a shot, see what you think. If you have seen it back in the day but didn't rate it then, maybe a rewatch and reappraisal is in order. Couldn't hurt, could it? Yeah, I know, personal nostalgia might be responsible for making me an apologist for it, but I really do like the film for its good points and even some of its bad ones. As for the title I've given this video, if you don't know what it means, that's okay. Neither do I. Thank you for taking the time to watch and listen, if indeed that's what you did. I mean it most sincerely when I say I appreciate any and all attention and input. Feel free to comment, like, don't like, suggest possible review content, or subscribe to the channel. Or do nothing. We have so little choice these days, I feel it important to provide some. Doesn't cost me anything. Meanwhile, here's a song called Man in a Suitcase. <laughs> Man in a suitcase 
Case Man Out of Time. I never get an even break when the odds are ever short. What exactly does it take? Out of luck and out of sorts. Tell them anything you like They won't ever ask for proof They always want to hear Everything except the truth I would walk out of this world Show me a sign Man in a suitcase Man out of time why don't you just grow up and face it, embrace it, get it through your head? A savior won't show up to keep it, to save it, so save yourself instead. Peace.